So your book um, is really excellent. And two things struck me when I was reading it. One is that a lot of people say that things are capitalist and part of the capitalist system, but they don't really define what they mean by that. And you have a kind of economic argument behind no, yeah. the prison system that's not the typical capitalist corporation centered story. It's much right. more about a system of profit, as you describe it, as opposed right. to like run and designed and maintained by particular corporations. The thesis of the book is, this is like an old book, right? 20 years old, 1999, lockdown America. It's an early part of this, what then becomes a, a, a burgeoning literature. But at that time, there was very little written about, about criminal justice. It was not like a cottage industry the way it is now. So I was trying to understand why it is that uh, incarceration rates start shooting up in the late 60s. And the answer, and then keep going up into the late 90s, you know. And the answer that I came upon was sort of two part. One, it's like the first moment has to do with the political economy of the sort of, you know, Keynesian consensus, the, the, the managed capitalism, the embedded liberalism that comes out of the New Deal, World War II, and is developed further under the war on poverty. That what happens is, um, well, that, that's important in terms of um, understanding sort of the longer trajectory of stuff. So, what, so at, as the 60s are unfolding, two things are happening. One, there is a blossoming of social movements that some of which are very, very radical and disruptive, right? And they're starting to threaten the status quo. There's also a saturation of world markets and profit rates begin to decline. Uh, and basically what, what is happening is that the World War II cleared the decks of accumulated capital and thereby it set the groundwork for a long expansion. From the end of World War II into the late 60s, the mid 60s, there is simultaneously high rates of growth, um, rising and high taxes, rising wages, and also very healthy profits. But by 1966, 1967, profits begin to plateau and they sink to uh, an all time low in around 1973. And it's in this moment that the ruling class starts to question the Keynesian consensus about how to run capitalism, which boiled down to essentially giving a little to keep a lot. That, you know, the, the, the part of, you know, what Roosevelt did was, you know, you know, assist poor people, but part of what he also did was basically make sure that capitalism did, didn't keep exploding in our faces by redistributing a little bit of wealth to prime the pump in Keynesian terms, right? Beginning in the late 60s, going into the early 70s, there's the beginning of a profit crisis. At the same time, there's this, you know, massive rebellion. There, there are, there's the civil rights movement. It has turned into the black power movement. There's all sorts of community organizations in every city and there's the riots. And so in 1968, Lyndon Johnson and Congress passes the, this omnibus crime bill in 1968 and, and Johnson signs it. And this creates the law enforcement assistance administration, which is this huge federal agency that over the next 10 years will seek to modernize policing and Specifically, the crisis that this was hung upon was the fact that from 1963 or four on, there had been massive riots in multiple U.S. cities, every city, right? And in, there's uh, a report commissioned by the government, the Kern Commission, Kerner Com Kern Commission report, Kerner Commission. Uh, sorry, sorry, Kern Commission. I think um, I'm dyslexic, so it's like oh, really, words, like yeah. I'm are you really? Severely, I'm severely That's dyslexic. So you're like, really one of the smartest people like, I know. So you should words be are like Chinese like, characters. If okay. there are any dyslexic people watching, I'm not kidding. They must be very. Um, What's the word? Validated. Not to suggest you don't feel validated if you're dyslexic, but that's really cool. So you're a bad speller. I'm yeah. a bad speller, but I don't have. I'm not dyslexic, so there's like, yeah. Interesting. Okay. So. The current commission report finds that um, every single one of these riots was 
precipitated by an act of police brutality. Every single one. So they realize, okay, wait a minute. Like cops are destabilizing the United States. And this is becoming a problem internationally because this is the height of the Cold War and the U.S. is trying to tell the rest of the world to follow its model and reject communism and socialism. So there are both internal and external reasons or reasons of domestic and of foreign policy to reform the police. So the, the, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration sets out to do that. But really what it does is it basically starts modernizing the police in ways that are not particularly helpful. It's, it, you know, it, it, it's what leads to the beginning of police militarization. That's when cops all start getting helicopters, SWAT teams, starting using computers, et cetera, et cetera. Learn so how to read. One. I didn't know this until I, I uh, read your book, that they didn't know how to, it wasn't a requirement to know how to read. Yeah, in many places it was not. After, that, after the book was published, I remember I had lunch with some guy who had worked at the LEAA, Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. Yeah which for 10 years gave a billion dollars a year to local law enforcement, back when a billion dollars was real money, right? Um, and yeah, he, he, he told me he, was, he processed an application from a Missouri sheriff for like a police car or whatever, where the guy signed with an X. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, that, so that's like the first wave of the buildup. And it's very much about counterinsurgency. It's about sort of like militarizing, importing the tactics of counterinsurgency. And there's always been a back and forth between like, you know, the streets of cities and the, the kind of imperial adventures of the Marines. I and mean, this goes back and forth. Um, there, the second wave of this crackdown and each of these is themed around a war on drugs. Sorry, so, I just wanted to clarify because someone said, when was it that, the, that, when was this change when they were required to learn how to read? And is this, would they have to take tests on it? Or? Yeah, it's all part of the reforms that, I mean, beginning in the early 70s. This is, okay. you know, so the federal government would tell states that they had to set up a state office of, I forget what they're called, SPLA, I forget what this, I forget what the ex exact uh, name of these offices were, but they had to have a state level office to interface with, with the LEAA. And that office would then um, in, you know, in, ex in exchange for receiving federal largesse would promulgate and do its best to enforce better standards. So cops could, you know, get, radios in their cars and they could get better cars and they could get helicopters and they could get other things. But then, you know, the patrolman would have to like have a certain functional level of literacy, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it was like carrot and stick. It was like, if you want some of these goodies, you guys have to kind of raise your standards a little bit. So that's how it worked. And it was, it wasn't a single specific date. It was, a, it was a sort of a 10 year process from 68 through the late seventies. And by the end of the seventies, uh, a lot of this LEAA money has been seized upon by progressives, sort of, and it's being used to reform southern prisons because many southern prisons were into the 1970s still organized the way they had been organized 100 years before. They used the trustee system. Texas was the last, the armed trustee system. So if people have seen the, the Robert Redford movie Blue, uh, Brubaker, that's yeah, I mean, it's a Hollywoodization, but I mean, that is actually how Arkansas ran. That was set in Arkansas. And that guy studied um, Brubaker, the real Brubaker, studied with people like Tony Platt, radical criminologist, British criminologist, who ran a whole school of radical criminology at UC Berkeley. That was the entire school with multiple departments in it was shut down because it was run by Marxists. Um, one of the greatest sort of... Um, acts of academic red baiting perhaps in American history was the, the attack on that, uh, that school in, in uh, UC Berkeley. Anyway, Brubaker had come through that. And in, in like the late 60s, early 70s, Arkansas had 3,000 prisoners and like 27 civilian employees because they basically used armed trustees, armed prisoners as guards. They these guys would be rewarded if they killed escaping prisoners, they would get pardons. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So what happened was that a lot of civil rights activists who in the 60s had gone through these jails and prisons were by the 70s, you know, 10, 12, 15 years later, they're like 
they, they're organized enough and they have enough power that they're getting some of this federal money, steering it away from the cops and imposing modernization on Southern prisons, which were really, really violent and really backward places. Texas only gets rid of the, the armed trustee system in 1981. So anyway, the whole kind of build out of the criminal justice machinery sort of starts to plateau in the late 70s into the early 80s. Uh, and I should say, I mean, it's not just the LEAA, it's also Nixon's war on drugs. And, you know, there's like these, the formation of the DEA out of the Bureau of Dangerous Narcotics and Drugs. There's, you know, uh, numerous other sorts of federal efforts to militarize the police, beef up the police and militarize the discourse. Right. And to create a, a hysteria or moral panic around crime. Though, to be fair, there was a lot of crime in the 70s. Much, much more than there is today. And that probably has to do, and I say this with this caveat, I am not someone who goes in for biological explanations at all. But that I a lot of it has to do with like lead and getting lead oh, out lead. of gasoline. Not what I lead, okay. crime, rates, crime rates drop as average blood lead levels drop. I mean, it's, it, the correlation is weird. Anyway, that's wow. another story. That's really interesting. So then yeah. the second part of this, this, this process then kicks off a second time under Reagan. And what Reagan is doing then is dealing with the, the, the profit crisis. That throughout the 70s, profits are kind of like, you know, stagnant, not what they were. And the ruling class, the politicized element of the owning class in the U.S. has from the beginning of the 70s gone from being ardent Keynesians to the end of the 70s being like opposed to it. So in the beginning of the 70s, you have Nixon saying, experimenting with it, a universal basic income, a UBI. And a, a journalist questions him about this. And he says, well, we're all Keynesians now. So he said, that oh, right. says, you're a conservative Republican. Why are you experimenting with a universal, universal basic income? That's very Keynesian. He says, well, we're all Keynesians now. By oh, the end of the decade, you have, you have Carter cutting taxes on the rich, increasing military spending, deregulating trucking, telecoms, and I think uh, rails, and appointing Paul Volcker as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Volcker, in the, and so what's happened during the 70s economically is stagnation has happened. A wage price spiral has set in. That wages are going up, but prices are going up just as fast. And so inflation becomes a very serious concern for the working class and for elites, for the owners of the means of production, profits uh, and rents become a very serious concern. And inflation hurts that. So in an effort to smash inflation, an en a recession is engineered by Paul Volcker at the Federal Reserve. He jacks interest rates three different times interest rates, the, the Fed funds rate that the Fed sets for banks to lend to each other overnight reaches 20%. And that means so like if you had a credit card, credit cards weren't that big in 1979, 80, 81. But that meant if you had a credit card, you were probably paying like, you know, 27, 30% on, on your interest. Or if you took out it, if you took out a mortgage, you know, it was going to be closer to 30%, which is insane. So by jacking up interest rates, he stopped all lending and borrowing, and that crashed the economy into what was then the worst recession since the Great Depression. And Volcker did this with an explicit class agenda. He is, in 1981, one of the largest banks in the U.S. is starting to go under because of this, because it, is in, is, it has in, invested heavily in Mexican government debt. And Mexico has borrowed to, against its oil reserves in, a, in an effort to try and avoid the resource curse and not become addicted to producing oil and selling it internationally. So they're borrowing against their oil reserves to boost their industrialization. When interest rates go through the roof in the early 80s because of Volcker's actions, the debts that Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil are carrying become impossible to service, and the Latin American debt crisis happens. So the first, first continental of Illinois actually goes under because it owns so much Mexican debt. Congress people start getting freaked out about this. They call Paul Volcker, chairman of the Federal Reserve, in, and they question him in Congress. And he explains to them, they say, you have to cut 
interest rates. You can't starve the economy of capital this way because unemployment is over 10% and uh, banks are failing and things are getting out of control. You have to increase the flow of government credit to the economy. And he says very explicitly, I, I can't do that because we haven't seen wages go down yet. And he has several other quotes like that where he's really clear. He's like, the reason I'm doing these painful things is so that the standard of living of the average American worker will go down. I mean, he says that. And this is a Carter appointee, right? Yes. So, so Reagan just doubles down on that. There's the Volcker shock. Reagan comes in, he you know, attacks unions, fires Patco, right? Uh, paternal order of air traffic controllers. They had endorsed him. They're the, the 11,000 of them go on strike. Get. He fires them all slashes taxes for the rich, like eliminates a whole um, department, uh, uh, HUD. Housing and urban development was like a whole department that's just like uh, reduced down into some other part of the government, you know, lays waste, uh, pursues a radical neoliberal agenda, and that creates massive inequality. And so then the, the second kind of war on drugs under Reagan is about, not about repressing social movements and stopping rioting. It's about explaining why there are suddenly thousands of homeless people in New York City where that had not been the case before. And that is done by blaming the poor and criminalizing them, et cetera, et cetera, and managing these contradictions. Sorry if I've been rambling on. No, 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 no. I'm just thinking managing, right. So the first, sorry, so this is the second wave or the third wave we're up to right now with Reagan? So that, this is the second wave. All right, so the, so the second wave is about homelessness. The first wave is about repressing. Well, homelessness and just managing inequality generally. You know, Economic. By, it's about like neo, neoliberalism. It's not, it, it, is, it is not in response to the Black Panthers, the Young right. Lords, uh, the American It's not Indian counterinsurgency. Right. right. Okay. It's basically just managing an increasingly unequal society. Right. Okay. So that's that could two. explode politically, or but it's also just like economically. So, for example, I mean, a lot of this has to do with the changing role of cities. So San Francisco, for example, which is what I wrote many years ago, wrote my PhD about. I mean, San Francisco transitions from a port city with light manufacturing and longshore, you know, dock work to a, a fire, right? Finance, real estate and insurance, entertainment, theme park city. Well, Back when it was a rough and tumble working class industrial light industry port city, it didn't really matter if there were homeless people sleeping on the street or pissing on the street. You know, I mean, the waterfront in San Francisco was populated by tough longshoremen and, um, you know, nobody cared how it smelled. Right. It was about how fast did you get the coffee off of the boat. But when those same spaces become the eating areas for mid-level corporate functionaries, then it really does start to matter if there are homeless people camping there. When the city subsidizes to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars the construction of a major convention center, it really does matter to both capital and the local state if gaggles of dental hygienists who are coming to their convention in San Francisco are afraid of aggressive panhandlers, right? And the city, so this is now brings us up to like the 80s, right? So the city government in that situation, and this is replicated all over the country, exact same kind of transformation happens in a lot of different places. They, they can't turn to the federal government and say, hey, would you help us with a New Deal style jobs program, drug rehab program, and house building program for all these homeless and destitute people? Because the answer would be, no, we can't. We don't do that anymore. But we do have subsidies for your cops, and we can help you expand your police force and, quote, unquote, professionalize your police force. Right. And thus, you know, begins the whole broken windows, quality of life policing. And, and so part of what that is about is um, that visible poverty in an industrial economy doesn't cause economic problems. Visible poverty in a service sector and spectacle based economy does cause real economic problems. And the only way municipal governments could deal with it was with force, right? I mean, they shouldn't have dealt with that way, but that was like, that's what was coming down from the feds. It's like, we can help you. We can subsidize you. If you want to kick their asses, 
and drive them out and blame them and develop stories that, that make it okay for middle class voters to accept this kind of tyranny over the poor, uh, we can help you with that. If you want to, if you want to pursue some outdated, silly FDR kind of thing, you're on your own. And right. good luck, little little government of San Francisco, standing up to Bank of America. You think you're going to get Bank of America to fund your housing program? It's like, be very careful because Bank of America just might go somewhere else. Yeah. Wow. I just found myself self empathizing with those with the people. Well, I mean, it's good to understand. I mean, you have to no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know. Like, you understand, weird, like, yeah. okay, it's not, it's not as simple as like they're just jerks. Bad, it's like, no, they're yeah, really structure, they're structured, right? Right. right. Yeah, wow. we all, we'd all like to think we're always going to be heroic under every circumstance. Right. That's like, did you see that movie Uncut Gems? No, I didn't. Should I? It's really good. All right. I'll tell okay. you about it later. Next time you're on, after you've watched it, I'll explain okay. why it came into my I head. I saw Joker because of you and uh, you and Matt talking about it. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah. Like yeah. an idiot. I read the New York Times review of it, and I was like, this sounds like a stupid movie. Yeah. And, and did you like it? It's amazing. I was like, no wonder they, no wonder the Times trashed it. It yeah. has a movement called Kill the Rich in it. Yeah. Right. That, and you know what? I didn't see it, but uh, Leslie Lee from Struggle Session and Jack Allison really liked it. And then my parents saw it. My dad was like, did you see Joker, Katie? I was like, no, I didn't. He's oh, like, you got to see it. He's like, mommy and I thought it was very sad. No, you got to see it. It's all about like neoliberalism. That's what I said, um, yeah. Yeah. No, the no. liberal the liberal pundits do not like that that not. movie. They 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 it accuse them of being racist. It's like no, it's like right, yeah. His key the, the character's key tether to reality is this African American social worker, right. and she says like I can't. I my job is being cut. Like I'm not going right. to be here for you anymore. Yeah. It's very explicit. That this guy goes insane because the social welfare system of the seventies is dissolved and destroyed right. under the onslaught of the kind of like, you know, Reagan era. Right. Yeah. Finance. I'll send you the bonus episode that I did with Leslie Lee where he talks about that movie. And then stage three. Yeah. So uh, the final stage. The final stage is, you know, by the late nineties, there's a there's an elite rethink underway, and many of the same newspapers and TV shows that have been hyping the war on drugs in the late 80s, early 90s, or by the late 90s questioning, like, wait a minute, why are we putting so many people in prison? Does this work, et cetera, et cetera. And you actually see incarceration rates begin to plateau. And then 9-11 happens. And then you get the Patriot Act and you get another tsunami of federal money. And then you get this kind of, kind of revivification of this whole process of over-policing and over-development of incarceration and surveillance. And that's finally now, you know, beginning to plateau. We've actually seen incarceration rates go down for a couple of years. Uh, the rates of police killing are going down. And certainly, as witnessed by this nationwide rebellion, people are fucking sick of the cops. You know, and it's not just about, this is not just about people being killed by the cops. This is about people having to live with the cops. Right. You know? People are pissed at the cops, not because necessarily, you know, that they're afraid of getting killed, though they are, but they, they just don't want to be hassled constantly. Right. And I'm like a, you know, I'm a middle-aged, you know, professional class white guy, and I feel like this. I yeah. drive a lot, you know, and it's like I'm constantly being pulled over, constantly dealing with the cops. I ride my bike around New York City. I've gotten three tickets in, in less than 10 years. I've had to go to court on one of them. It's just, it's like nonstop, you know? Yeah. And I mean... And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the demographic and the type who does not get hassled by cops. And right. I find them to be a pain in the butt. Right. If non-lethal. Yeah. But still, yeah. S small towns in America are like infested with police. Yeah. Um, so what is, uh, so how would you def like describe the three phases? You have the, if, if the first one is counterinsurgency operation, like, kill protesters. Yeah, uh, operation, first one is counterinsurgency. The second one is about restructuring. Next, the second one is about neoliberalism. Right. And completely restructuring the political economy of the, of the country and deindustrialization, financialization, and the restructuring of cities. And then the kind of management of inequality with police force. And the third phase right. is sort of the, the spillover effect of the war on terror. That if right. you, in the name of fighting Al Qaeda on the other side of the planet, if you basically make it that much easier for prosecutors to charge people on flimsy evidence and scoop up evidence without jumping through the hoops they used to, 
Well, I mean, don't think that's not going to like trickle down to right. to oxycontin dealers in southern Ohio. Of course, they're also going to be swept up in massive numbers and go to right. prison. You know, and it's like, um, and you know, and 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 police departments that have nothing to do with terrorism will get subsidies in the name of terrorism. Yeah. I couldn't believe when I was reading your book, um, the asset forfeiture, like, I think I, I mean, I know what that is and I've heard about it obviously, but like that's, I, I didn't realize how direct of a kind of bribery that was. Yeah. That you mean that local cops get to keep yeah. a portion of these. Yeah. How is that legal? Um, uh, building consent around it, you know, I mean, it's, le it's legal because whatever the people who write the laws say goes is legal. So then the right. question becomes, well, how is it that people writing these crazy laws keep getting elected? And I mean, it has to do with the spectacle, the fear of crime, the racist, the right. kind of like, you know, racist, you know, discourse, um, that was so important in the 80s and 90s into the early 2000s. That stuff has really, really been rolled back, though, which is which is a very important and good thing. And I mean, it's it's partly the result also of just how much more diverse the country and how much more integrated the country has become, you know, even in the last 20, 30 years. I think that's important to say because sometimes in the left, we're just always like, it only gets worse. It's just terrible. Blah, blah. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. It's terrible, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also victories and there is progress, you know?